Hey there folks, Zach here. In this video, I'm gonna give you a quick recap of what we learned in week 11. This week, we talked all about double integrals, which are extensions of single integrals to the two variable setting. As you learned, the motivation behind double integrals, their applications, and even the way we evaluate them are all very similar to what we learned back in Math 138. However, setting up a double integral at the start of the calculations can often be a little bit more challenging. So let's go back to the beginning and talk about the motivation behind the double integral. Suppose that we have some surface, the graph of a function z equals f of x, y. To start, we'll assume that this surface lies entirely above the x, y plane. Maybe we want to know the volume under this surface, the volume under the surface and above a particular region d in R2. Let's say that d is this rectangular region here. Hmm, now this reminds me of the problem of finding the area under a curve over a given interval. That's a problem you learned about back in Calc 2. How did you solve this problem back then? Well, you probably sliced up the interval into a bunch of tiny pieces and used a rectangular area to approximate the area under your graph on this tiny subinterval. You then added up these areas to approximate the total area under your graph and by letting the cuts in your interval get finer and finer and finer, your approximation of the area got better and better and better. This limiting process led you to the definition of an integral. Well, in Calc 3, we do the same sort of thing to find the volume. We slice up the domain into a bunch of tiny little pieces, and on each piece, we approximate the volume under our surface using the volume of a rectangular box. The area of the base of this box is just the change in x times the change in y, and the height is given by the value of our function at some point in this piece, say x i y j. Therefore, this expression, area times height, gives us the volume of the box. Adding up these volumes over all pieces and letting the cuts in our axes get finer and finer and finer, we approach the true value of the volume under our surface. And this, folks, is what we define to be the double integral of f throughout the region d. Now this is all well and good, but nobody wants to compute a double integral using this gross definition. Ugh. Instead, as you saw in the lessons, we can use what we know about single integrals to help us. Specifically, we can evaluate this double integral by first integrating with respect to one of our variables while holding the other variable constant. Maybe we start here with y giving the integral from c to d of f of x, y, dy. And throughout this integral, we would treat x as like constants. And then we would have to integrate with respect to the other variable. This gives us the integral from a to b of this expression dx. Now, if we're integrating over a nice rectangular region where x and y are nicely bounded between constants, a, b, c, and d, it turns out that the order of these integrals doesn't matter. This is exactly the same as integrating first with respect to x from a to b, and then integrating with respect to y from c to d. But in situations where your region d is more complicated, it's a bit more challenging to set up these integrals and to swap the order. We'll get back to this a little later, but for now, just take this as a word of warning. Okay, enough theory. Let's take a look at some examples. For our first example, let's try to find the volume under the graph of this function, z equals e to the minus x minus y, and above this region d in the xy plane, where d consists of all points where x and y are between 0 and 1. Okay, well according to what we learned on the last slide, the volume under this graph and above the region d is given by our double integral. It's the double integral over d of e to the minus x minus y dA. To evaluate this thing, we're going to rewrite it using two single integrals, one with respect to x and the other with respect to y. Since in this example we're integrating over a rectangle with x and y bounded between constants, the order doesn't matter. We could integrate first with respect to y or first with respect to x. So for no particular reason, let's start with y. We have the integral from, well, it looks like 0 to 1 of e to the minus x minus y dy. And then we're going to integrate with respect to x. We have the integral from 0 to 1 of this expression dx. Notice that I didn't write the brackets here. It's understood that we do the inside integral first and then the outside. 
In this case, though, I think I see a little shortcut that we can use. Notice that the integrand, e to the minus x minus y, can be split up into a product. We could write this as e to the minus x times e to the minus y. Since our inner integral is written with respect to y, we're going to treat this e to the minus x term like a constant. It could be pulled out of the integral. That would give us the integral from 0 to 1 of e to the minus x times the integral from 0 to 1 of e to the minus y dy dx. Finally, notice that this entire integral with respect to y really just represents some real number, right? It's a scalar. We can therefore pull it out of our integral with respect to x. We can pull constants out, right? So we could rewrite this thing as the integral from 0 to 1 of e to the minus x dx times the integral from 0 to 1 of e to the minus y dy. And from here, it's not too hard to evaluate them. An antiderivative of this expression with respect to x would be minus e to the minus x. And likewise, an antiderivative of this expression with respect to y would be minus e to the minus y. Plugging in our upper and lower bounds, we should get a final answer of 1 minus 1 over e squared, which is roughly 0 0.4. If we take a look at the graph of our function over this region d, we can actually see the volume we've just computed. It's this volume right here. Notice that this little trick that I've used during the calculations will always work if you're integrating over a nice rectangular region with constant bounds, and your integrand factors nicely into a function of x times a function of y. Let's check out another example. For our second example, we're looking to evaluate this double integral, the integral of y times sine xy from 1 to 2 dy, and then from minus 1 to 1 dx. If we were to evaluate the integral as it's currently written, our first step would be to find an antiderivative for this expression with respect to y. Ah, but notice here that we're really working with a product of two functions of y. So finding an antiderivative would probably require something like integration by parts. Ugh, I don't want to do that. So instead, I'm going to be a little bit sneaky. Rather than integrating first with respect to y, I'm going to switch the order and integrate first with respect to x. My double integral can be written as the integral from minus 1 to 1 of y times sine xy dx, and then the integral from 1 to 2 of this expression dy. To understand why this was helpful, note that finding an antiderivative of y times sine xy with respect to x is actually quite easy. We're going to treat all of our y's like constants. So I can kind of ignore this y when I'm looking for my antiderivative, and an antiderivative of sine xy, where y is constant, is going to be minus cos xy over y. I evaluate that from x equals minus 1 to x equals 1, and then I have to integrate from 1 to 2 dy. Now notice, folks, that a small miracle has occurred. These two y's kill each other, dramatically simplifying our integrand. We have the integral from 1 to 2, and when I sub in these bounds for x, I should get minus cos of y plus cos of minus y dy. Now remember, cos of y is an even function. So if I replace y with minus y, nothing changes. This is the integral from 1 to 2 of minus cos y plus cos y. It's 0. Ooh, did we make a mistake? After all, if this double integral is supposed to represent a volume, the volume under a surface, how are we getting an answer of 0? To understand what's going on here, let's take a look at the graph of our function, z equals y times sine xy, throughout this rectangle in the xy plane. Ah, we can see that part of the graph lives above the xy plane, but part of the graph dips below. It turns out that our definition of a double integral applies to these functions as well, but the double integral in this case won't exactly be computing a volume it's going to treat the volume above the xy plane positively, and it's going to treat the volume below the xy plane negatively. So what we're really computing here is what you might call a signed volume. It's the volume above the xy plane minus the volume below the xy plane. This is just like what you know about single integrals in Calc 2. They compute a signed area, the area above the x-axis minus the area below the x-axis. In this example, our two volumes cancel out perfectly, giving us a final answer of 0.
Now here's where the fun begins. Most of the time, we're not gonna be asking you to integrate over nice rectangular regions. We're gonna give you something a little bit more complicated, a little bit more general. In these two pictures, you can see sort of the next level of difficulty when it comes to double integrals. On the left, we have a region D where X is bounded between two constants. But Y, well, Y is not bounded between constants, it's bounded between two functions of X. On the right, we have a similar situation. Y is bounded between two constants, but X is bounded between two functions of Y. Many texts will creatively refer to these regions as regions of type one and regions of type two. So how do we integrate over a region like this? Well, let's start by looking at the type one region on the left. We're gonna start with the variable that's bounded between functions, in this case, y. For every value of x, we see that our y values throughout d are always larger than g1x, but always smaller than g2x. If you draw an arrow moving in the direction of the positive y-axis, you'll see that g1x is always the lower curve, g2x is always the upper curve. These are going to be our bounds on the y-integral. We have the integral from g1x to g2x of f of x, y, dy. Now what's x doing? Well, x goes from a to b. So we have the integral from a to b of this expression dx. Now notice folks that it was important that we started with the variable bounded between two functions because when we integrate with respect to y, we're gonna substitute these bounds, giving us an integrand that just depends on x. Next, when we get to our outer integral, we're gonna integrate out all of the x's, giving us a real number in the end. But if we wrote our integral in the other way, first with respect to x bounded between constants, and then with respect to y bounded between functions, we're gonna end up with expressions involving x even after evaluating both integrals, and that's not what we want. So it's important that we set up the integral in this order. What about for our region of type two, where x is bounded between two functions? Well, in this case, we're gonna start by integrating with respect to x. For each value of y, as we move through our region in the direction of the positive x-axis, let me draw my arrow here, you can see that the x value is always larger than h1y, and it's always smaller than h2y. So these are going to be our bounds on x. x goes from h1y to h2y. We have f of x, y, dx. What's y doing? Well, y goes from c to d. And there you have it, folks. This is how we're gonna set up integrals over more general regions. Let's check out an example together. All right, folks. In this example, we've been given a double integral that's already set up as two single integrals, the inner integral with respect to y and the outer integral with respect to x. We're being asked to sketch the region in R2 over which this integral is defined, that is, the region defined by these bounds, and then we're being asked to evaluate this thing. So let's start with the sketch. Based on the setup we have here, we can see that our y values are bounded between two functions. The lower function is y equals x squared. It's an upward opening parabola and it looks something like this. The upper function is the line y equals four, which is this guy here. So our y values lie above the parabola, but below the line. They lie somewhere in this region here. We might not be interested in the entire region, however. We should ask ourselves, what's x doing? From our outer integral, we see that x is contained between zero and two. Ah, x equals two is exactly this point where the parabola and line intersect, and x equals zero is here. So we're not taking the entire region, we're just taking half of the region. This is our domain of integration. Our next task is to actually evaluate this double integral. So perhaps we should start by looking for an antiderivative of this function with respect to y. I'll turn it over to you. Can you give me an antiderivative of sine of y to the three halves with respect to y? Well, go on, I'm waiting. Well, you haven't found one yet? That's because it's not so easy to do. In fact, there isn't a nice elementary antiderivative of this function with respect to y. It just doesn't exist. So what do we do? Are we stuck? Well, not exactly. Remember, in our last example, we were able to more easily evaluate our double integral by switching the order. Finding an antiderivative with respect to y looked like a bit of a pain, but finding an antiderivative with respect to x wasn't so hard. Well, the same is true here. I can't find a nice antiderivative of this function with respect to y, 
but I can find a nice antiderivative with respect to x. After all, this function doesn't have any x's. We'd be treating y, and therefore the entire function, like a constant. So this is our game plan. We're going to switch the order of integration to first integrate with respect to x, and then integrate with respect to y. The integrand isn't going to change when we make this swap, but the bounds on our integrals will. If we're going to integrate first with respect to x, we have to ask ourselves, as we move throughout the region, are the x values always nicely bounded between two functions of y? The answer in this case is yes. For every value of y, if we move in the direction of the positive x-axis, our x values are always larger than the values on this vertical line, x equals 0, and they're always smaller than the values on this parabolic arc, y equals x squared. So x equals 0 is going to be our lower bound, but what's our upper bound? Is it x squared? No, if we're integrating with respect to x, we don't also want to see x's in our bounds. We're expecting to see functions of y. So how can we rewrite this curve with x as a function of y? Well, we're only dealing with positive x values, right? So in this case, we could say x equals root y. That will be our upper bound. What's y doing? Well, y is bounded between the constant values y equals 0, the x-axis, and y equals 4, this horizontal line. So here is our new double integral, written first with respect to x, and on the outside with respect to y. On the next slide, we're going to evaluate this integral and wrap up the problem. Now that we've reordered our integrals, let's try to evaluate this thing. An antiderivative of sine of y to the 3 halves with respect to x is simply x times sine of y to the 3 halves. We're going to evaluate this from x equals 0 to x equals root y, and then we're going to integrate y from 0 to 4. Now folks, when we sub in our bounds, something magical happens. We get the integral from 0 to 4 of root y sine of y to the 3 halves dy. We're set up perfectly to do a substitution. If we set u equal to y to the 3 halves, then du is 3 halves y to the 1 half dy. Or in other words, 2 thirds du is a root y dy. Ah, but we have root y dy. Things are going to clean up so nicely here. For our bounds, notice that when y is 0, u is also 0. When y is 4, u is 4 to the 3 halves, and that's 8. So we get the integral from 0 to 8 of 2 thirds times sine u du. At this point, I think you can wrap up the problem. You should get a final answer of 2 thirds times 1 minus cos 8. Pretty neat, huh?